Hello everybody and welcome to the IHTA seminar, Town and Country Perspectives from the Irish Historic Towns Atlas. My name is Sarah Geerty and I'm the Cartographic and Managing Editor with the Irish Historic Towns Atlas or the IHTA, which is a research project of the Royal Irish Academy Dublin. We've been running this seminar annually since 2009. Usually we would be together in the meeting room of Academy House, Dawson Street. And though we regret that that's not possible, we are delighted to welcome our virtual audience today, wherever you may be. And there's lots of people signed up and we have hundreds of attendees, so welcome one and all. Today is the first in a series which will run through May with lectures each Thursday lunchtime. It is convened in association with our colleagues in the British Historic Towns Atlas and Keith Lilly will chair the plenary lecture by Professor Keith Dyer to round things off on the final day, which will be the 27th of May at 7 p.m. The IHTA project is very much a cooperative venture and it is in that spirit that this long awaited seminar has come about. Born out of discussions at our regular board meetings and here I would like to acknowledge the ongoing enthusiasm and contribution of our IHTA editors. Raymond Gillespie, Howard Clark, Michael Potterton, consultant editor Angrid Sims and welcome our two recently appointed editors Ruth McManus and Jonathan Wright. So you will see some of their faces over the coming weeks. Michael Potterton in particular was instrumental, instrumental in shaping this seminar and I'm happy to report that he and I are the editors on the book Town and Country. So these seminar papers will be published by the Royal Irish Academy over the coming year or so and that book will be dedicated to the cartographic historian John Andrews who died in 2019 and who was so influential in the formation of the Irish Atlas. Going virtual with this seminar has involved a whole new layer of know-how and patience for all concerned. And in bringing the seminar lectures to you in this way, we are lucky enough to have our own Jennifer Moore, who has rallied us all and is coordinating the production with the help and expertise of Alan Jacob from the Academy's IT department. The theme for the seminar brings us from the centre of town to the hinterland, from the urban to the suburban. And we are looking forward to hearing our speakers exploring town and country over the coming weeks. The lectures take a chronological approach, so we will begin today with monastic tenants, Viking raiders and Hiberner North townspeople with Howard Clark and Ruth Johnson. Howard will speak first and before I have the pleasure of introducing him some practicalities. The audience cameras are all off and the mics are muted, but please do get involved by using the webinar's interactive features. You can submit questions to the speakers at any stage and we encourage you to do this during their presentations as they occur to you. So you can do this by using the Q&A facility in the control panel. Then at the end of the two presentations, questions will have been published and the speakers will address many of as many of the questions as they, as they can and I will direct the questions to them. We are recording the seminar and we hope to share the link at a later date. If you would like to tweet about the event please do the hashtag is hashtag IHTA 2021. Now may I introduce you to Professor Howard Clark, medieval historian, member of the Royal Irish Academy, and long-standing editor of the IHTA. He is retired from the School of History and Archives at UCD and has worked extensively on medieval towns, including those of the Viking Age and especially on Cork and Dublin. Monastic tenants, Viking raiders and Hiberno Norse townspeople. Over to you, Howard. Thank you, Sarah. In a volume of essays published in 1998, arising from the International Conference commemorating the 1200th anniversary of the first recorded Viking attack on Ireland in the year 795, I stated the following. It would be truer to suggest that there never were any Viking towns in Ireland. The word Viking is in italics for emphasis. A statement of this sort, going against the grain of so much of the secondary literature, depends heavily 
on the definition of terms. What should we understand by town? And what should we understand by Viking? It is abundantly clear that both of these terms are understood and used in a great variety of ways. An immediate complication involves another word, city. In volume one of the Cambridge History of Ireland, published in 2018, there is an essay by a very reputable scholar entitled The Scandinavian Intervention. This deals with what is often regarded as the Viking Age in Ireland, that is to say the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries AD. In urbanizing contexts, the standard usage in this essay is Hibernanor's town, and on one occasion, Viking town. But in three instances, 11th century Dublin is referred to as a city. This is not the only place in academic writing where one sees this usage. But to me, it reflects a total misrepresentation of the nature of Ireland's first urban settlements. In settlement historiography, it is desirable to preserve the Oxford English Dictionary's specific definition of the word city, which is a title ranking above that of town. One of the few genuine cities encountered by so-called Vikings was Constantinople, where rough and ready Swedish river traders were strictly controlled in their activities and led them stay by sophisticated Greeks. I shall therefore dismiss out of hand any notion of Viking cities in Ireland. On the other hand, the question of Viking towns in Ireland deserves serious consideration. There is now an immense archaeological and historical literature on the subject. The question of town origins in Ireland is bedeviled by disagreement about what constituted a town. The approach favoured here is a simple one, based on a straightforward functional definition of an urban economy in contradistinction to a rural one. Leaving aside the individual farmsteads and small settlement clusters, including hamlets at the lower end of the scale, and the cities and megalopolises at the upper end, the fundamental distinction in European settlement history is that between a village and a town. A village composed mainly of farming folk existed primarily to produce food and drink, the latter as a byproduct in Northern Europe and as a speciality in Southern districts devoted to viticulture. A town composed mainly of craft workers and traders ex existed primarily to produce and to distribute artifacts made locally and imported from elsewhere with the support system derived from the rural economy. Factors such as the size of the population, the type of street pattern, the number of churches and the range of public facilities could vary considerably in both categories. Some medieval villages were substantial, had markets and even fairs, yet their economies remained essentially rural. Some villages teetered on the, teetered on the brink of becoming towns and could do so if conditions were favourable. Much settlement history was evolutionary in nature and is poorly documented. The best known examples were revolutionary as a consequence of human agency, hence their appearance in the historical landscape. Before the 12th century, town foundation as a conscious exercise by lords, including kings and princes, was not usual. The process was normally gradual and obscure. A rare Viking Age exception is the apparent promotion of Hedebu, German Heitebu, by the Danish king Godfred in the early 9th century. More debatable are the Anglo Saxon Burrs, Old English Burdi. Were they founded conceptually as towns, or should they be thought of as stronghold settlements? that acquired an urban character at some stage. The interval of time between the most intensive phase of Burr construction, which is 880 to 920 on the one hand, 
and the beginning of the Norman Conquest in 1066, and the groundbreaking evidence produced by the Doomsday Survey of 1086, on the other hand, The term proto-town is far from being universally accepted in the world of scholarship, but will be adopted here. Back in 1985, Angrit Sims and I attempted to classify proto-towns into four main types, allowing for the possibility of hybrid formations. The terms chosen were designed partly with natural German equivalents in mind, since scholars writing in that language have done so much to advance our understanding of settlement types. The proposed terminology is trading settlements, stronghold settlements, court settlements and market settlements. The third of these terms was intended to allow for the possibility in northern parts of early medieval Europe that non-Christian so-called pagan sites were capable of performing proto-town functions. Proto-towns lacked a specific town law and constitution. They lacked a close association between a, a central market and craft working and long distance trade. They lacked a stable settlement fabric and defensive wall. During the distinctly unstable early Middle Ages, by which I mean AD 400 to 1000, when warlordism was much commoner than effective kingship, town-like settlements emerged gradually for a variety of reasons. A standard process that has long been recognized in historical scholarship is that of a pre-urban core or nucleus around which a town grew up. The core might take many forms, a primitive trading emporium, a stronghold and later a castle, a cathedral or big monastery, a marketing center inland or even on a beach. Early medieval Europe came to be acquainted with towns and with town life, but Ireland, like Scotland and Wales, was a land with a minimal trend towards urbanisation. This can be seen in the context of another scholarly debating ground, that relating to the notion of monastic towns or even monastic cities. The great majority of Irish monasteries were totally embedded in a rural environment. Most monastic settlements survived on the labour of tenants and of Marnie who enjoyed a semi-religious standing as clients of the saint in question. They were married men with families farming the land. The concept of monastic town is grounded on a small number of the largest and best documented sites, such as Armagh, Clonmacnoise, Kells and Kildare. And there you see Kildare um, with its doubling social site. Kildare, by the way, was uh, produced by John Andrews, in whose memory this series is being produced. Key features of the layout of the bigger monasteries are fairly well understood. The inner core of double enclosure sites like Kildare was always the preserve of ecclesiastics of various kinds, reflecting the primary function of these institutions as high status centres of religious devotion and observance. The western side of the main or sole church was the location of the platea, a ceremonial semi-public space distinguished in some surviving cases by a round tower and one or more high crosses. Towards the east or southeast, there was sometimes a different kind of public space reserved for trading purposes. A market cross is known to have stood at Armagh and Kells, whilst other examples probably existed but have not survived. And there you see Kells and you can see on the eastern side that the trading function gave rise to the street name Market Street. At what point in time was such a model created? One of the 
principal proponents of the monastic term concept, Charles Doherty, has provided us with a reasonable answer to the effect that it happened during the course of the early Viking Age. A few pages later, in his highly influential essay, published in 1985, he makes a surely correct, if contradictory, statement about his monastic towns. In them, and I quote, wealth was generated on the basis of agriculture and livestock, unquote. Quite so. Functionally, therefore, these places were not primarily towns. They depended economically on a rural support system and may have engaged in literally peripheral trading activity. We are far removed from the concept of an urban hierarchy dominated by merchants. Accordingly, Irish ecclesiastical sites of the bigger sort are best regarded as a species of proto-town in the category of cult settlements. Their trading functions, where they can be localised topographically, were always peripheral. What then are Viking raiders? In the past, Ruth Johnson and I have adopted a particular view of the Viking Age as it applies to Ireland. For the Viking Age as a whole in a Western European context, a dating range of about 790 to about 1100 works well in terms of event-based history. A subdivision into two roughly equal halves at circa 950 conforms both with the concept of England's two Viking Ages and with the archaeological and documentary evidence for Ireland's best recorded and understood site, Dublin. As here defined, the early Viking Age was the classic period of raiding and of naval encampments denoted by the word Longfoot, plural Longfoot. As is well known, two of these were established in the same year, 841, at Anagasson, whose Irish name is Linduacle, on the south side of Dun Dundalk Bay, and the other at Dublin, Dublin, on the south side of Dublin Bay. In both cases, a monastic site was taken over as a resource for shelter and food. Longford sites have been identified by Eamon Kelly in counties Clare, Galway, Kerry, Leash, Meath, Roscommon, Sligo, Waterford and West Meath, as well as these in Dublin and Louth. Yet all but one of these came to little or nothing in terms of permanent settlement and still less as towns. In fact, Dublin is the sole exception. After a destructive campaign directed over land against Armagh in 852, nothing further is recorded of Anagassan until the brief reference in 926 to 7. Significantly large areas of the interior of this site seem to have been relatively open, with possible paddocks and gardens for livestock and crops. In other words, this mid 9th century Longford was relatively self-contained and self-sufficient without an extensive hinterland. The arrival of Our Leave the White in 853 and the establishment of the Kingdom of Dublin, or the Kingship of Dublin, together with the latter's command of four major overland routeways across Ireland, appear to have brought about the eclipse of Anagassan. The other Irish Longford that has been subject to extensive ground survey and limited archaeological excavation in recent years is Woodstown in County Waterford. Completely undocumented historically, Woodstown comprised two D-shaped enclosures along the south bank of the River Shore, separated from one another by a ditch and possibly suggestive of a somewhat longer time span in the 9th century. There is archaeological evidence of ship construction and maintenance, of metalworking in iron, copper and silver, and of trading in the form of silver ingots and an exceptionally large assemblage of weights. The latter is unparalleled in England, that the absence of a documentary record may be interpreted to suggest that Woodstown had little political impact on the surrounding countryside and its Irish inhabitants. The Woodstown Vikings were relatively peaceful traders rather than aggressive raiders. 
all the signs are that Woodstone is best thought of as a classic proto-town of the trading settlement variety. Only later, during the 10th century, was it superseded on a completely new site by the Hiberno North town of Waterford. At Dublin, the balance of Viking activity in the 9th century and on into the 10th was different. The Scandinavian inhabitants were raiders as well as traders, and under leaders regarded as kings in both Irish and Icelandic sources. The annals record numerous raids and battles across a wide area, as well as Irish attacks on Dublin starting in 936. There are some clues to the extent of the hinterland of Dublin's Longfirt, both archaeological and documentary. There can be no certainty in the matter, but the Norse place named Wingate may represent a natural frontier to the south in alignment with the Dublin mountains. The first King Aulieve's defensive outpost called a Dune towards the west at Clondalkin was destroyed with brutal force by the forces of the Leash in 867. The local Idunkuna, in turn, appeared to have responded with the erection of a long-standing cairn of stones at Dolphin's Barn, a name thought to be derived from the Irish Carni Nunkada, which would remain as a prominent feature of Dublin's territorial liberty for many centuries to come. Towards the north, the rivers Tolka and Broad Meadow Water provided natural boundaries. Politically, Viking and Hiberno Norse Dublin were always regarded as part of the Kingdom of Leinster, hence the tribute paid to its potential kings detailed in the early 12th century Book of Rites. There are other signs of the small and compact nature of the countryside controlled by Dublin's Vikings down to the middle of the 10th century. Most noticeably, the geographical spread of furnished pagan graves. The classical age of Irish Viking grave goods has been defined as circa 830 to 930. The Dublin grave fields, containing 87% 80, of all Irish Viking graves, were concentrated in an area measuring 8 kilometres north-south and 10 kilometres east-west the great majority on the Leinster side of the River Liffey. Here you see a map of the main grave fields at uh, Kilmainham towards the right and Island Bridge towards the left. All the signs are to the effect that the original 9th century Dyfrina Skiri, Dublinshire, was small, compact and mainly in the provincial kingdom of Leinster. We can assume that it was extensive enough to support so-called Vikings and their male and female dependents in life's essentials, supplemented by occasional raiding and even more profitably by regular slave trading. For those day-to-day -day essentials, a well-established socio-economic mechanism would have been available locally. For as Fergus Kelly remarks in his book Early Irish Farming, I quote him, by far the most important transfer of foodstuffs in early Irish society was the food rent which a client paid to a lord." Unquote. Viking Dublin's warlords and their henchmen would have emulated warlords throughout the ages by exacting tributary payments from the surrounding population. Other types of tribute took the form of providing building materials and skilled or semi-skilled labour for their utilisation. Only thus can we explain one of the most striking of recent archaeological discoveries, the Type 1 houses and other structures found in late 9th century levels at Essex Street West. The eastern core of Hyperna North Dublin had been established. And by the eastern core, I mean the Dyfflin area uh, on that map there. The question arises, and assumptions have been freely put forward, about whether the inhabitants of 9th century Viking Dublin should be regarded as townspeople. Too much has been made of the larger houses and their plots. The basic point is that the existence of plot divisions is an indicator of nucleated settlement. 
without appropriate socioeconomic indicators, it is not proof by itself of urbanism. Thousands of medieval European villages had house plots side by side along the streets. Much of the archaeological evidence from Messick Street West has strong rural associations, a ploughing level, sunken featured buildings, wattle enclosures and animal pens. In the homeland of those Vikings, and in a Danish controlled part of it, the only known town-like settlement was Kaupang, K-A-U-P-A-N-G. There was permanent settlement and plot division only at the western end of the plateau excavated relatively recently. A more northerly peripheral area lacking plot, plot divisions being used in the summer months by craft workers and traders living in tents. Ninth century Dublin is best regarded, like Kaupang, as a prototoan of the trading settlement variety. From what point in time then did Dublin, as by far the best documented and understood of Ireland's prototown sites with Scandinavian involvement, acquire the character of a relatively stable urban environment devoted primarily to craft working and trading. Notwithstanding the restoration of its kingship in 917 and its spectacular military victory over a Northern High King's army at Island Bridge two years later, Dublin remained politically unstable until the middle of the 10th century. Grandsons and great-grandsons of Ivar the Boneless, King who died in 873, abandoned Dublin in succession, presumably with their entourages, to become or attempt to become the King of York in Northern England. The first of these post-restoration kings, Citric Cach, married a sister of King Ethelstan of Wessex in 926, only to be cut short in his ambitions by dying in the following year. Slave trading continued to be the mainstay of Dublin's economy as the use of Dorky Island as a slaveholding base in 940 indicates. The best evidence for the 10th century built environment is still the sequence of plots along the western side of Shambles Street, although it should be borne in mind that a single street frontage on the northwestern edge of the eastern core may not have been typical. Such as it is, however, the impression given is that the density of housing shows an increase from level five onwards. On the basis of coin evidence, this level has been dated to the years 962 to 971 in a brilliantly designed chart by Matthew Stout. The level you see here is actually level eight, late, late 10th century. This was the time of King Olive Kuran, who having failed twice to have himself accepted as King of York, returned to Dublin in 952 and devoted himself to the development of a comparable town, though not yet with mentions of coins. In level five, the house nearest the Liffey side was the home of an amber importer and manufacturer, representing trading contacts with the Baltic Sea and the emergence of a craft working tradition. Dublin was starting to function as a regular medieval town. It had also acquired earth and timber defences, dated archaeologically as Bank 2 at Wood Quay to circa 950 or somewhat earlier. A mid-century mid date would accord well with the major destruction by the Leinsterman in 944, when according to the more elaborate record in the Annals of the Four Masters, and I quote it, its houses, fences, ships and all other structures were burned, its women, folk, young men and dependents were carried off into bondage, unquote. The changed nature of the built environment appears to have been recognised by the author of Chronicum Scotorum, who for the first time applied the traditional epithet for a stronghold, doom, to Dublin. In effect, it had the appearance of an Anglo-Saxon burr, but without a Christian church inside its earthen timber defences. There had been no sudden realisation of what a town should be like. Dublin had evolved gradually and somewhat hesitantly 
from a Viking proto town into a Hiberna Norse town. Greater chronological uncertainty attaches to all four of the other candidates for town like status. Recent work on Wexford, first mentioned in the Annals in 935, has suggested that the initial settlement by Vikings, properly so called, occurred at the southern end of Main Street, followed by Hiberna Norse urban expansion northwards. At Limerick, the first Longford may have been in place at a sharp bend in the River Shannon by 8.30, represented now by a D-shaped enclosure and the place name Athlonkert, meaning Fort of the Longford. There you see that from the Limerick Atlas. This was destroyed by the Irish of Connacht in 887, and a second Longford was apparently established at the southern end of King's Island in 922, five years after the recapture of Dublin. And there you see it, and what the Americans were call, would call a one-horse town. It was very small. Fairly rapidly, nevertheless, it would seem the superior site evolved into a town, coincidentally with Dublin. At a greater geographical remove, Woodstown was arguably Waterford's first Longford, prefacing a refoundation downstream in 914 on a more seawardly accessible and militarily defensible site. In the following years, Waterford clearly became the focus of Viking raiders, but its evolution into a Hiberna Norse town is much less certain since most of the archaeological evidence dates from the 11th and 12th centuries. Waterford's equivalent of Dublin's main series of house blocks comes from Peter Street, starting in the period 1056 to 1064. Cork provides yet another example of site relocation. The first Viking raiders may have established themselves, as Vikings did elsewhere in Western Europe, on an island in the River Lee, known for many centuries as Dungarvan, that is to say, on either side of North Main Street. From there, they were evicted by the forces of the King of Munster, Okavar Makineda, in 846. After the great influx of Viking warriors into Southern Ireland in 914, another group set up a trading settlement, probably in the Cove Street area, on the South Channel of the Lee. Only much later, starting in the 1090s, was the South Island colonised by means of land claiming as a more defensible location for urban expansion. In every case, therefore, a relatively settled community of craft workers and traders emerged during the course of the 10th century, following on from the longfoot of the initial Viking raiders, Viking raiders, and often on a different site. Urbanization in early medieval Ireland is better thought of as a Hiberno-Norse or Hiberno-Scandinavian phenomenon than a narrowly Viking one. By the same token, to quote Danica or Coroin, the pattern of Scandinavian borrowing of Irish personal names, I quote, indicates that deep intermingling began to occur from the middle of the 10th century, unquote. A sense of dual ethnicity was evolving in socioeconomic life as befitted a truly urbanizing culture. Nearly all of the archaeological evidence for craft working conducted on a regular basis dates from the mid 10th century and later. Trading, as in modern farmers markets in public parks or in car boot sales on suitable patches of ground, can take place more or less anywhere. A beach or a field will super suffice. Craft working, on the other hand, requires continuity of supply of raw materials and security for equipment and skilled personnel to convert them into saleable goods. In the case of Dublin, still the best documented candidate chronologically, this more stable environment becomes clearer in the continuous part of the reign of Ali of Kuran from 952 to 980, which coincided with the general reduction of Viking hostilities in Ireland. As a failed King of York, he had been exposed to, and may even have enjoyed, town life as we might understand it. 
And this is Patrick Wallace's image of Dublin about 1000 AD, about 20 years after the death of Aulif Kuran. Mention of Aulif Kuran calls to mind another factor that's been excluded from most considerations of this subject, women. Because of her fame or infamy, Aulif's second wife, Garamla, is known to us as the mother of Citric Silken Beard, the second wife of Brian Baru, and in turn the mother of his successors, King of Munster. The great majority of women in Viking Dublin and elsewhere must have been Irish. Their social status presumably ranged from that of their legally acknowledged and free Scandinavian husbands down to the level of concubines and domestic slaves. Their children may well have been bilingual and rapid cross-cultural assimilation would have occurred right across the social spectrum. Girls inherited from their mothers and from other adult females a whole range of practical domestic skills. Even in their proto-urban phase, therefore, Ireland's Viking trading settlements would have been influenced powerfully by the native women folk. Ireland's Hiberno Norse towns were social products, female and feminine, as well as male and masculine. And now it seems appropriate to hand over to a woman. Thanks very much, Howard. Uh, and apologies to Howard and to everybody because we did lose connection there uh, towards the beginning. Uh, but quickly got back. So thanks to Jennifer and Alan in the background there and hope everybody was able to hear after that. Um, just to say we are getting questions in about availability of these talks after this event and we do hope to make them available online. Please keep an eye on our website ihta.ie for that. And also to say I, I think I referred to Professor Ke Chris Dyer as Keith earlier, so apologies for that. Our plenary session, why should historians also study the countryside with Professor Chris Dyer will be chaired by Keith Lilly on the 27th of May at 7 p.m. So thanks again for Howard, to, to Howard and we are now going to hand over to Ruth Johnson. Dr. Ruth Johnson is the city archaeologist for Dublin City Council. She and Howard have collaborated extensively over the years in the belief that an interdisciplinary approach to the past produces the best interpretative results. So monastic tenants, Viking raiders and Tyburner North Town people part two. Over to you, Ruth. Thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Howard. Um, over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to present just a collection of thoughts in response to Howard's paper. It's very much a work in progress. Um, I've been trying to put together evidence for 9th, early 10th, late 10th and 11th century, century Dublin chronologically. Um, and, and that will be the basis of the paper um, that we publish in uh, the next year or so. But today I'm just going to start by talking about some of the more recent inf information that we've uh, got from commercial excavations. It's generally accepted that from around 840, Longford and Ireland operated as Emporia for exchange within the North Atlantic Maritime Network, bringing a new market economy to Ireland of the type evidenced at Reba, Birka, Kaupang and Hedeby in Scandinavia. The Longford or Longford of Dublin were apparently occupied for around three generations from 841 to 902. Until fairly recently, the early stages of the Scandinavian settlement in Dublin proved difficult to locate and understand. The recent archaeological evidence for early Viking Dublin has been examined in detail by Lindsay Simpson. Sorry, I'm trying to move this. Um, uh, Lindsay noted um, early structures and burials on the south side of the Black Pool at South Great Georgia Street, Ship Street in Golden Lane, which she calls the Poddle Group, and evidence for early ploughing and settlement activity on the west bank of the Poddle at its confluence at the River Liffey at Temple Bar West and Parliament Street. This latter site was Dublin's pre-urban core, the nucleus around which the town grew up from the mid 10th century. Here's some of the excavations, um, the location there of the Temple Bar 
finds and there's some of the excavations that took place around Ship Street and the Poddle Group. The material culture in Ireland in the early medieval period was relatively homogenised and local, local trade is hard to trace psychologically in comparison with exotic long distance imports like pottery, glass and weapons. But some 9th century agricult um, rural agricultural settlements um, engaged in local trade have been identified as possibly Scandinavian and Rebecca Boyd has done a huge amount of work on this, particularly from the point of houses. One such site was excavated at Cherrywood in County Dublin, which yielded structures, graves and Viking type artefacts, including a, a fragment of a whale bone plaque, um, as shown here, which is ethnically distinct. Viking graves are also distinctive and they're generally considered to be settlement indicators in both insular contexts and the Scandinavian homelands, with a few exceptions. The large island bridge, Kilmain and burial complex is widely considered to be associated with the 9th century long fort at Dublin. O'Flynn and Harrison have observed the correspondence between many Viking burial sites in Dublin and the boundaries of the high medieval liberty. The early settlement of Dublin was effectively ringed by Viking burials, many of which were located at critical access points such as roads and fords and often close to Christian churches such as St Michael the Pole thus controlling imports and exports into the settlements. A study recently decoded the genomic sequence of the female burial um, excavated in Finglas in 2004. This woman was in her 30s. She was buried in the late 9th century outside the Christian graveyard associated with the early medieval monastery dedicated to St Canis. The study of her DNA revealed high levels of Norwegian-like ancestry. What might we infer about the burial of such a high estate as female migrants at a monastic site six kilometres to the north of the early settlements in Dublin? According to Kaga Gael in 845, the Dublin Vikings plundered the Midlands Monastery, including Finglas. It was Finglas thereafter an outpost of the Dublin settlement, controlling the rural region that came to be known as Fingal in the Annals. Viking Age society in the Scandinavian homelands was based on rural farming communities and had a regionally based power structure. Does the, women, the woman's burial at Finglas signify the location of a farm, perhaps, or of a monastic centre under regional Viking control, re resourcing the main Dublin settlement with, of, um, with food, wood, fuel and raw, mater raw materials for craft production in the late 9th century? Longfort and river camps have recently become the focus of much scholarly attention. An overview of the Irish evidence by Eamon Kelly shows that these riverine sites were widespread, operating as temporary bases for raiding and trading in the countryside. The partially investigated mid to early 10th, mid 9th to early 10th century ship camp at Woodstown in County Waterford was a short lived, possibly intermittent and apparently non defensive settlement. It's described as a hive of industry and a commercial centre by the excavators. The industry represented at Woodstown is metalworking, boat building and ship repair in the Scandinavian tradition. The commercial activity is represented by lead weights, hacked silver ingots, Arabic co coins and fragments of Irish metalwork. Likewise, at Anagaston in County Loud, the small excavations at the 9th century enclosure revealed the byproducts of metalworking and ship industry trade and textile manufacture. Woodstown and <clears throat> such sites may have had little political impact on the surrounding countryside, but the Vikings here were not peaceable traders. According to Neil Price, Price, raiding, slaving and trading were integrated activities in the early Viking Age. Woodstown and Anagassum were thus part of the internal infrastructure required by Viking war bands and fleets. There were places where specific specific crafts and certain types of regulated trade could take place between Vikings, presumably. Notwithstanding the lack of defences, we're reminded of the martial function of Woodstown by the warrior burial. It located immediately outside the northeast entrance of the enclosure in a prominent position that would have been seen who, by all who approached and left it. The inhabitants of such long at Woodstown, Anagassan and Dublin would have plundered local stores or fields for food, once, but once settled, evidence suggests they began the cultivation of crops, keeping animals and gardens. 
At Martin's Row in Chapel Izzard, the remains of a large dry stone vertical undershot mill and mill race were discovered, dated and dated by Claire Walsh to the late 8th or 9th century. Shortly after, Hibernian Norse type houses and property boundaries were found to accord with these with earlier agricultural boundaries at the site, suggesting a continuity of tenancy before and during the early Viking Age. This mill would have supported a population of around 100 people and would have been contempor contemporary with the early recorded Viking settlement in Dublin and the burials at Island Bridge, Kilmainham. Was it under their control? I think it might have been. Here's a photo of the excavation at Chapel Lizard. At Golden Lane, um, excavations on the margin of an early medieval cemetery associated with the Church of St. Michael of Pole found a corn drank hill, indicating that grain was being processed on the edges of the settlement. And it's been um, uh, radiocarbon dated to between 894 and 1020. Interestingly, the, the kiln type is typical of the early medieval Irish um, uh, uh, archaeology and um, is associated, however, with pagan Viking graves. The site lays close to a metal early medieval roadway and may have been an area used for crop processing, industrial activity, or possibly even as a marketplace. We await the results of excavations carried out recently to the Norsa graveyard. And here's a photograph of um, a substantial earthen bank discovered by Alan Hayden last year. I'm grateful to him for letting me share his Facebook post here. Um, and that will give more definition about the nature and extent of the early settlement and land use just outside the later dune. Moving into the 10th century, Plot 11 at Fishamble Street was situated on the high ground towards the western side of the dune and was initially an area of commonage used for informal burial and dug features, including a square pit used for retting of flax until the mid 10th century, after which it was developed extensively for housing. This western part of the dune was also used seasonally for crop processing and perhaps as a market prior to its development. Like Golden Lane, it was conveniently located for receiving goods from the rural hinterland, being close to a major road, this time the Schlemor. Excavations at Werberg Street in the 90s provided evidence for 10th century occupation and crafts organisation in the southern part of the Hibernian North Town. The earliest feature here was a 10th century bank and within it, nine separate properties were identified containing the remains of approximately 30 buildings, including type 1 and type 3 houses, circular huts and a sunken structure, all of mid 10th to late 11th century date. A range of crafts were carried out in these houses with woolens and textiles, leather, iron, bone, antler, amber and woodworking, all evidenced by implements and waste. A hoard of 125 late 10th century Anglo-Saxon silver pe um, pennies was found, which is similar in comparison to those found nearby at Castle Street and suggests that the crafts practice here were very lucrative and that coins were being used um, to, uh, uh, by these uh, craftsmen. Um, in their interaction with uh, the hinterland. At Castle Street, the remains of Hibernian North houses, property boundaries, paths, pits and ancillary structures represented seven or eight distinct phases of habitation. The largest building dates to the mid 11th century. It had a plank furnished floor inside its southern doorway that incorporated reused ship timbers. A large amount of amber waste from this structure indicates that it was an amber workshop. Three separate silver hoards were recovered from the early, earliest phases of occupation here, all within footprints of houses. Were such coins the mean of, means of exchange for the raw materials coming in from the rural hinterland, the Irish Sea, or both? A characteristic of urban craft in the Viking Age towns is spatial persistence. Viking towns comprise relatively settled communities of people engaged in specialist craft or associated mercantile activities supplied with imported raw materials from outside. This is true of Dublin from, archaeologically speaking, from the mid 10th century onwards, where houses and plots were occupied by dedicated craftspeople, wood turners and coopers at Wide Tavern Street, amber and jet workers at Ishamble Street, leather and bone workers at High Street, and fine metal workers at High Street in Christchurch Place, all depending on raw materials coming in from elsewhere, as well as the food 
um, and the timber that was the essential raw material for constructing the town. <clears throat> Our understanding of the early Viking settlement and the high burn in North Town of Dublin is changing rapidly. Recent excavations um, by Paul Duffy at Angel Street uncovered evidence for a steady domestic presence from the 11th, from the mid 11th century onwards. A large curving early medieval ditch um, was in use also in the 11th century and a similarly lined sunken floor structure pictured here was used for industrial activity. So the <clears throat> suggesting that this ditch may have been domestic or secular rather than ecclesiastical as previously thought. Excavations on the Coombe re revealed a street of high and Norse houses and plots dating from the late 11th to early 12th century. The street was 450 metres outside the high and Norse town walls on the bank of the Coombe stream at an intersection of the five great roads of early Ireland. Similarly, on the north side of the Liffey, the remains of a large um, type 1 house of 11th century date was found fronting onto Church Street, the main road leading from the north of the country into the wall town in an area that later became known as Osman's Town. Dublin then was expanding for, far beyond the stone town walls into the countryside in the late 11th and early 12th century. To conclude, sorry that's just a picture there showing you some of the, the plots found on the Coombe by Ashling Collins. To conclude, from the mid 10th century we, onwards, we can say that the archaeological evidence suggests that Dublin had become certainly an emporium and probably a town composed mainly of craft, craft workers and traders, and that by the late 12th century it expanded into the surrounding countryside to the north and south of the town. Um, this paper has been challenging for me because um, some of the issues that some of the questions that Howard posed were about chronological development development, what does the archaeological evidence from the 9th century, the early 10th and the second half of the 10th and 11th century say about the development of the town from Pro um, Longfort to Proto Town to Hibernian Nost Town. Um, and some of the challenges that I faced were the unreported and unpublished excavations and the low level of environmental sampling analysis and interpretation. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there and say thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. Uh, and we just have a, a few uh, minutes left uh, before two o'clock uh, and we can go on a little bit after that, I think, but we want to keep within the hour. Um, and we do have a couple of questions um, for Howard and Ruth, so I might just get stuck into those. And do please, if you have any questions, pop them in the Q&A box uh, now and we'll try and get to them within the few minutes. Uh, so Howard, we might you might start on this one, please. Uh, when we use the term trade and slaves, or slaves were trade and slaves, would that be the Vikings in the settlements or between the Irish and them? Also, do we think of the towns in the way we think of Goa as a fortified foothold? Yes, there are two questions there. Um, the one about the slave trading, uh, we basically don't know, I think, who was buying and who was selling slaves. Um, we would like to know that. Uh, and of course, it's uh, it's also a question of male and female slaves that um, they had different purposes. And Anglo-Saxon evidence suggests, for example, that um, that male slaves cost twice as much as a female slave. You would get few, two females, the price of one male, on an Anglo-Saxon market in the 11th century. Um, so there are all sorts of issues there about slave trading, and um, we basically don't know, I think, uh, what the answer to that is. But I think um, uh, we can assume, I would assume anyway, that there were Irish purchasers of slaves produced by the Vikings, as well as other Scandinavians. Because after all, most of the people in the country were Irish, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the country. The, the Scandinavian settlements are very small and few in number, the permanent ones. And um, so I think if there was, but then it's a question of whether slave trading involved sending slaves to places like Iceland uh, or elsewhere, particularly Iceland in the late 9th century onwards, if these Dubliners 
these Derby Vikings were selling slaves, they might have been selling them to Icelandic purchasers. So, but we do, I think we just don't know the, the numbers involved or, uh, or exactly how the mechanics worked. Um, the second point to that question was, um, is it a kind of uh, Goa type place? Uh, I think that's actually quite an interesting parallel that if, if I understand it correctly, Goa was a, por a Portuguese uh, base in, in, in India, in the Indian subcontinent, and uh, as a kind of intrusion, like Hong Kong, uh, uh, the English intrusion into China, that kind of place, I think you, it would be worth thinking about um, these Viking establishments as uh, intrusions of that sort, sort of uh, with, a, with a strong trading and commercial um, uh, aspect to what they did. Good question. Thank you, Howard. And we see a couple more questions coming in and we might go to Ruth for this one because it's more archaeological in nature. And Ruth, I'm going to run a, a few into one if that's OK, so if you can retain these in your head. The first one is, has any evidence been found of the location of the Long Fort in Dublin? Has any housing evidence been discovered at Kilmainham? And the third question is, what building or structure would you be most excited to find the site of? So the first is the location of the Long Fort at Dublin, uh, housing evidence in Kilmainham, and the third is uh, building or structure you'd be most excited to find at the site of. And Howard, you might like to answer that at the end as well. I'm sure everyone has thoughts on that. Over to you, Ruth. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. In relation to where is the long force? I mean, that's been the um, the question we've all been asking. But I think that I think that the archaeological evidence from from the um, Temple Bar and the Puddle, the south bank of the Puddle, is kind of building up a very strong case for a long fort having been there. Um, there may also have been a long fort at somewhere around Kilmaine and Island Bridge. Um, at a, an important fording point there, um, but we've no archaeological evidence for that. But the archaeological evidence so far for the Longfort suggests that it is on either um, side of the puddle um, in the ninth century. Um, in terms of the housing at Kilmainham, no, that's a, just a no, there's nothing, there's no evidence. Um, just sadly, just the graves and um, probably um, uh, if it if there had been, it might not have been picked up. It might have been negative features or cut features that might not have been found um, at the same time that the grey fields were um, excavated in the 19th century. Um, so unfortunately, we're still looking for that information. And the final thing, I think, I mean, I'd love to find an early, a, a pre-Norman um, uh, wooden church you know, the precursor to, to Christ Church, perhaps, possibly the Mint, a Royal Palace, you know, I mean, like the list is endless. I'll hand over now to Howard. Uh, I, I think Ruth touched on an important point. One shouldn't be looking only for the long foot in the singular of Dublin, one should be looking for the long foot in the plural, exactly as at Cork, exactly as at Limerick and exactly at Waterford if you count Woodstown as the first Longfoot and Waterford as the, as the second one. Um, in terms of um, uh, where, what would I like to find archaeologically, uh, I would like to find the Royal Hall of the Kings of Dublin. There was a whole succession of kings, they lived in a presumably in a Royal Hall, there's no sign of any kind of compound of that sort yet found. The assumption has always been that the most probable site was the site of the later castle, the Anglo-Norman Anglo castle, which may well have destroyed most of the evidence for whatever preceded it. It was on the north side of the pool and is a very likely location, but uh, that's what I would like to find, the King's Palace. Thank you, Howard. And there's a, lot, a few more questions coming in and we don't have that much time, so I, I, we might just try and deal with the rest, but kind of briefly, if that's OK, and we'll hang on for another five minutes or so if, if, if you can uh, stay with us. Otherwise, if you if you have to get back, please do. Uh, this is a question about Dawkey Island. Uh, Howard, you might come in on this first and uh, the association with um, Dawkey Island as a staging post for slaves being exported by the Vikings. 
That's right. Well, the one clue about Torquay Island, the 940 AD clue, uh, as was pointed out by the late Alfred Smith, is the uh, analytic reference to the escape from Torquay Island of an abbot. And he unfortunately drowned trying to swim from Torquay Island back to the mainland. And the assumption is that he had been kidnapped by the Dublin Vikings and parked on Torquay Island, along with lots of other potential slaves. Uh, but and that, that's why he, but because he was an abbot, uh, an analyst took notice of that. That is really the one clue uh, as to that idea. But I think it's a very likely one that um, if the Dubliners were collecting large numbers of slaves, as they appear to have been, they had to park them somewhere secure with, from which they couldn't escape until they'd been sold to their new owners. So Dorky Island would have been perfect. And Dorky, of course, is a Norse name, which is also significant. OK, thank you. And question. You mentioned that the Viking settlers partnered with Irish women. Is there any evidence that females from their home country, countries, settled here at all? Uh, I don't know, how, Howard, you're there on the screen if you want to deal with that, uh, maybe. Well, uh, the well, Ruth can talk about this as well. But the um, the furnished graves, the evidence, the balance there between male and female is roughly uh, ten to one, I think, or nine to one. In other words, uh, about one tenth of the graves uh, are thought to have been female. The problem with a lot of the Dublin, most of the Dublin graves is that uh, they were not excavated professionally in the nineteenth century, and so we don't actually have very good evidence about the precise distribution of anything to do with those graves. Um, but in terms of the artifacts, um, the proportion seems to have been about 10 to 1. And so um, so some Scandinavian females, it is assumed, um, came with the men folk. But most of the most of the women, I think, in, in, in Dublin and in all the other settlements, as I said, would have been Irish. Thank you, Howard. And just um, we may only have time for a couple of more questions. Um, uh, sorry, I've just lost my place now. Uh, Ruth, is it correct to say the early Viking bank was re-established, re-fortified by the Normans? Sorry, am I on? Yeah. Yes. Um, OK, yes. so gosh, the. <laughs> The, um, the the evidence from Woodkey, I think, is the best um, evidence that we can that we can talk about there. So really, um, uh, we we started off with like low flood, low earthen flood banks in the 10th century, early 10th century, and then subsequently they were um, pushed out into the Liffey over time. Uh, bigger um, banks were constructed. They were refortified with palisades. Um, and then eventually then there were vetments and then subsequently there was um, uh, an Anglo-Norman uh, stone wall, uh, sorry, an 1100 stone wall followed by an Anglo-Norman stone wall and then a later 13th century key. So I think, yeah, I think it's, it, um, I think it's spatially, it changes depending on where you're looking around the city. Is that fair to say, Howard? Yeah. OK, thank you. And uh, we maybe go to Howard on, on this one. Uh, it's from our colleague Daniel Straka from the German Atlas on the slave issue. Viking slave trade would have ranged from the Eastern Baltic purchase to ex Islamic Spain selling, wouldn't it? And he also has a number, another comment, Howard, so I'll, I'll roll this in if that's OK. On what grounds you will have had reasons to do so? Did you mention Kapang? but omitted, omitted Haleby. Did you catch that, Howard? Yes, yes. Uh, well, I did I did mention Haleby, um, uh, but it's um, and that's an impressive site uh, now in northern Germany, though then in uh, then in Denmark. And um, a lot of archaeological work has been done on that site and um, and it's generally described as a as a, a town site in the in the literature and that's a reasonable description really of it uh, as i said it was promoted or is thought to have been promoted by the king of denmark godfred in the early 9th century and it was very strategically located between the scandinavian world the frankish world 
and uh, and the um, and, and the Slavonic world, the Slavic world, uh, so that it, um, it it had a huge um, trading impact on, on on in the Viking Age. But it was uh, abandoned in the end, which is why it's an archaeological site. It was destroyed in the in the 11th century and um, and replaced by Schleswig uh, uh, eventually as the nearby town. Um, yes. What was the other question? Sorry. Uh, about slaves. Yeah, yeah yes. the Baltic, Eastern Baltic to Islamic Spain. Uh, yes, that's yeah. right. Um, well, it's very hard to prove. There are a few stories about um, uh, slave, individual slaves or people who were enslaved um, traveling around, um, but we don't really have enough evidence, I think, about the geographical distribution of slaves. One can assume it was pretty widespread given the use of ships. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, there's a li little interesting detail in Icelandic law is that uh, slaves in Iceland um, were excused some uh, legal punishments because they were not thought to be fluent in the language, that they would, would make mistakes because they were Irish or something else. Uh, and um, so that was an interesting idea, I think, that because slavery involved uh, huge linguistic uh, challenges for the people taken to another culture with another language, that if you were Irish, but you might end up in Russia speaking uh, early Russian, etc. Um, so that, um, that there are all sorts of linguistic implications to the slave trade, which are very difficult to measure. Thank you, Howard. Um, we still have several more questions and uh, Ruth and Howard, I'm going to suggest that we stay on until a quarter past two. Um, if, if people are willing to do that and we, we leave it at that and Howard and Ruth can answer any outstanding questions uh, by email or by some other method after. So um, Ruth, perhaps you for this one. Um, thank you, Ruth and Howard. Uh, where are the best locations to see evidence of the Viking period? Ruth, where are the best locations to see evidence of the Viking period? Well, in, in Dublin, um, you can you can take a trip to um, the Woodkey venue uh, when government restrictions ease, and you'll be able to see the, the 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 first town wall that was built, probably in the reign of Marcus Doctor Green, the Hibernian Norse ruler, around 1100 AD. That's preserved there in situ. It was excavated in the uh, 1970s by the National Museum and most of the 120 metres of the wall was sadly lost and demolished um, in the construction of Wood Quay. But that one stretch of about 25 metres is still visible and we're actually in the process of conserving that at the moment. Um, and obviously, the I showed a slide there of the long fort at, um, uh, sorry, the the um, late 11th century stunk, um, stone sunken house that Paul Duffy excavated at Angel Street and that's actually preserved in situ and visible in the floor of the Lidl at Angel Street. Um, otherwise, I would recommend, highly recommend that you go to Dublinia um, and uh, both Howard is the trustee there and, and in prime instigator and uh, I was the curator there. And it has a really good exhibition um, of the, the history and archaeology of Viking Dublin. Thank you. So maybe while you're there, uh, did these settlements rely on rural hinterlands for foodstuffs or were they importing grain or both? Gosh, well, I mean, the, the one of the problems that, that I faced in preparing this paper was that the lack of environmental sampling and analysis in Dublin over the last 50 years of excavations um, that's made it through to the publication. Um, but I mean, there's um, obviously Michael Potterton and Margaret Murphy have, have looked at feeding the, the later town in the mid Middle Ages and, um, and some attempts have been uh, made to by people like Mary Vellante to sort of suggest how much grain would have been required for the settlement. And we're talking large quantities. We have to assume that um, uh, like things like livestock were coming in on hoof and that seems to be suggested in the faunal remains, that cereal crops were being grown in the immediate um, hinterland region, processed at mills like Chapel Lizard and brought in um, and dried and processed and stored and used in the town. 
probably from the, the 10th century at least onwards. In the long fort phase, probably um, it was more of a hit and run sort of a situation, a little bit of plundering, a little bit of um, pig farming, perhaps, you know, within the long fort um, enclosure and that kind of thing. So does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. And um, Howard, uh, you, somebody says here, you mentioned a Viking long fort in Galway. Where would that be? Under the medieval town? And I'll also, so that's uh, mention of the Viking long fort in Galway. Where would that be? And then another, for, I'll just mention this one as well. Thank you both for a very interesting paper in relation to the early medieval evidence. What are the speaker's views for historical and archaeological evidence for the confluence of major roads mentioned by both? Are we presuming unpaved, droved routeways rather than paved roads or trackways? Yes. Um, no, I didn't say there was a, a long foot in, in Galway in the city. Uh, I just said in County Galway okay. in, in Eamon Kelly's list, and, um, which, is, which is correct. Uh, they're scattered around. Uh, Eamon Kelly's done the, the major work on this, and um, there is a remarkable spread of them. But as I said, they all come to nothing except Dublin. Um, the uh, sorry, now the other question is so the other one is about uh, historical and archaeological evidence for the confluence of major roads. Are we presuming unpaved droved routeways rather than paved roads or trackways? Um, well, uh, trackways have been found uh, in in part in bogland in Ireland, uh, notably in uh, County Roscommon, and. Um, but but the dating of them is a problem, uh, and um, so it's it's hard to know. I think in many cases what their date range is, and um, at uh, Clamac uh, what has been described as a bridge across the River Shannon has been found uh, in, in in parts uh, the timbers of parts of, a, of what has been assumed to be a bridge with a dendrochronological date of 804, as far as I remember, um, which is a very important thing because. Um, that clump of noise was on the great east-west road across Ireland, the Schley War, and, um, and was the crossing point of, of, the, of that great road, linking Dublin Bay in the east and Galway Bay in the west. Um, so th there are some bits and pieces. The other evidence is, uh, is, uh, is literary, written. Um, there, there are references to, um, to uh, routeways, classes of routeways. There's an early text of the 7th or 8th century describing five categories of routeway across Ireland that I think Fergus Kelly published in at the end of, um, of, of, of one of his books as an appendix and you can find out about them there. Uh, but the highest category of road was a uh, Schlee, plural Schlitter, and, uh, and there are five named routeways of that sort, four of which converged on Dublin Bay. Uh, the other one uh, headed towards where Anna Gasson was established. Thank you, Howard, and thank you, Ruth, uh, for all the work that you put in to the, that paper that you presented jointly today. And we really look forward to seeing it in print in due course in the associated volume, Town and Country. It's just after a quarter past two. There are more questions, but we will come back to you in person if that's OK, because I think we're duty bound really to wrap things up now. So thank you. Sincere thanks on behalf of everybody here to Howard and Ruth for their papers and answering all those questions today. We are looking forward to seeing you all next week, same day and same time. Thursday the 13th of May at one o'clock for the next instalment, Town and Country and Later Medieval Ireland with Michael Potterton, Jim Galloway and Margaret Murphy. One booking on Eventbrite covers the whole seminar, so rest assured that you will receive the link for next Thursday in good time. And if others are interested, it's not too late to book and this can be done via IHTA.ie and there you can find information on how to purchase the IHTA printed fascicles and publications or explore for free IHTA.ie, which is our online atlas is highly recommended. So goodbye for today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our speakers and see you all next week. <laughs>